You're very welcome to the afternoon session of the Digitalization in Public Employment and Guidance Services, how apps and algorithms are changing the face of welfare delivery. So this session will focus on using digital tools in employment and guidance, uh, more from a practitioner and stakeholder perspective. Um, so my name is Nuala Whelan and I'm a postdoc researcher on the ACAPES project, which is um, a, collabor a collaborative approach to building public employment services. And with my colleague, uh, Professor Mary Murphy, we're working collaborative, collaboratively, I can't even say it now, <laughs> collaboratively with Dr. Michael McGann um, from the Governance of Activation in Ireland project. Um, so we, we're hosting uh, this um, digitalization mini conference um, today. So we had an excellent session this morning um, where the speakers gave us an insight into digitalization of public employment services. At an, at an international level and introduced um, some key themes that are emerging from this research. Um, so kind of themes around accuracy versus equity, agency, self-determination, cost effectiveness, surveillance, uh, and a whole range of issues that I think we'll probably see mirrored in this afternoon's uh, session. Um, so we have a wide range of attendees today um, from guidance practitioners in the local employment services, Job path, with job path providers, um, the ETBs, department officials, researchers, academics, and so on. So we're very happy that you've, uh, you're joining us on this lovely Friday afternoon. Um, so I suppose with the, the conference team really um, trying to focus in on, on guidance and uh, some of the one-to-one -one work that we are you know, very aware that's really important in the public employment service uh, when we're working with people who are maybe distant from the labour market. And much of this work that we do um, is built on trust, um, a lot of triaging, profiling really help us uh, make sure that the client gets the service that they most require at that moment. Um, so I think some of these issues will crop up as we go through um, the presentation. So just to give you a sense, um, well, first of all, we're carrying out a mini poll. Uh, so if you weren't with us this morning, uh, we're asking people to go to www.menti.com and use the code on the screen there, 3796492, and type in three words to describe how you feel about a more digitalized public employment service and guidance service. So we have some feedback from this morning's session and we'd hope to be able to show that um, later on um, in the session. So if you get a chance to do that, that would be really fantastic. Just a simple poll. Um, and just to give you a kind of an overview of who our speakers are this, morning, or this afternoon, uh, we have two excellent presenters. So we have Connell, Don Connell Donnery, who is the director of Taurus Nua and also general manager of FRS Recruitment. Um, first, he's going to speak about, um, I suppose, Taurus Nua's experience of using digital technology um, within their work. And that'll be followed by Bernadette Walsh, who's the guidance counsellor and education and guidance liaison manager with Careers Portal Ireland. And uh, Careers Portal has been doing a lot of work with guidance practitioners around using um, different methods and tools uh, with guidance practitioners to complement the, the work that they already do. Um, so each of the speakers will have 15 minutes um, and that'll be followed then by a panel of speakers. So we have Paul McSweeney from FORSA, uh, which is a public sector trade union, Reid O'Brien, head of policy and media in the INOU, Joan O'Donnell from Freedom Tech, um, and the Disability Federation of Ireland and Enable Ireland, and Helen Ryan, policy officer at the National Adult Literacy Agency. So the panel are going to have five minutes each to give us um, some feedback on the presentations, on their experiences so far in terms of the work that they do. Um, and that'll be followed then by a question and answer session. So please use the question facility um, on Zoom to, to feed us in your questions as we go through the sessions. And finally, um, Kieran Reid from the, uh, the ILDN and from Loud Media Partnership uh, will give us some of his comments and remarks and thoughts on what we've heard uh, today, both from this afternoon's session and also incorporating some of um, his thoughts from this morning's session. So I'd like to welcome you all again, and um, please do try and engage with us. We'd love to hear your, your thoughts and comments. So we might hand over now to um, Colin, 
um, who's our first presenter uh, this afternoon. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen here and hopefully Colin will uh, be able to share his slides. Thanks, Nola. Thanks, Amelia. Um, uh, just a big thanks to yourself um, and Professor Mary Murphy and, and Michael McGowan. I think it's been, it's been a fantastic session this morning. So um, I think what I'll do is I'll just kick on straight into the session. And um, we, I, I suppose 15 minutes isn't a huge amount of time for this, but I'll get through as much as I, as I can. So. Uh, so I'm Colin Donnery, I'm Director of uh, Taurus Nua, uh, we're a cooperative, uh, wholly uh, Irish-owned uh, social enterprise, part of FRS Network set up in 1980. Um, and today I'm going to talk about automation and digitalization in guidance services um, for the next 15 minutes. And just to give a bit of signposting, I'm going to talk about a previous research I did in, in 2017 I uh, did a master's of science um, in Ulster University and focused on artificial intelligence in recruitment. Um, I'll, I'll give the audience a quick look at, at what a chatbot looks like. Um, it's a recruitment chatbot, but it's relevant for the, the current discussion. And then I'll talk about the guidance journey in, in Taurus Nua and, and how we see that and how we see uh, digitalization and potential for, for automation within that, uh, within that journey. And I suppose the also the pitfalls. Um, so lots of people will have read lots of articles about you know AI and robots and how they're going to take jobs. And I suppose back in 2014, I, I became very interested in, in this and, and uh, decided to undertake uh, some, some research in the area. Um, as part of that, uh, I suppose the, the outcome of my research showed really that I suppose the future of work and, and move to uh, AI and robotics was more uh, evolution than revolution. And I think that's really what's playing out. But, but things are moving along. Um, and I, I was really fascinated by this area. Um, I've worked in, in the recruitment, employability and, and training uh, sectors for nearly 25 years now. So I think it's going to have a huge impact on, our, on the future of the uh, sector. Um, Back in 2017, I actually delivered part of this um, part of this presentation. Uh, I was invited by Mary Murphy to deliver a, a presentation for the 75th anniversary of the Department of Social Protection. Um, and what I wanted to do was just take a step back to then, to 2017, and see how things have moved along, if at all. Um, so this is called the Gartner hype cycle. So th basically, this is where Gartner uh, look at emerging technologies. Obviously, a little complicated sort of slide, um, but as technology moves along the cycle, usually what happens, a lot of it drops off and never happens, and obviously some technology comes into being. Um, so the two areas for my, my research that I looked at as part of my master's was um, artificial general intelligence and machine learning. Um, and I suppose general machine learning or general AI or general AI, sorry, not general machine learning, is basically if you, if you think about um, a robot and being capable of um, of actual intelligence and judgment, that is what general AI is. Um, that is still sitting at more or less the same point on point on the Gartner hype cycle uh, as it was in 2017, um, and I think the research and, and literature tells us that that is probably going to be the case for if not 10 years, definitely 20 to 30 years. So that's where things move along and basically machines are able to make decisions on, on their own. Um, I suppose what we are seeing in the marketplace across most sectors now is a proliferation of machine learning, um, otherwise known as narrow AI, uh, which is really good for tasks and prediction. And it really drives um, efficiency within organizations. Um, and uh, that actually left the curve last year in 2019 and left the curve basically because it was no longer hype. It, it, it was basically, um, have, I suppose, is ubiquitous across um, most sectors um, at this point. 
Um, so as part of my research to look at how, I suppose, um, artificial intelligence within the recruitment sector uh, would progress, um, generally I, I, I created a scenario plan um, for its future development and adoption. So on the, on the, on the uh, y-axis there, you can see general AI develops or it doesn't develop. And uh, on the x-axis, you can see there, there's a high adoption of, of AI or legislation shows slows adoption. Um, so when you, when you create um, scenario plans, typically you come up with uh, names that catch the attention. So um, I suppose the first one I came up with, which at, in 2017 is really where we were, which I, I called Commodore 64, which for all of you old enough to remember was one of the, the first home, uh, home computers. And basically what that meant was that technology really hadn't advanced very far. Um, and that's where we were in 2017. It was debatable whether things would move on. Um, and the next scenario where basically, I suppose, adoption had, had in, in recruitment um, had, had advanced, uh, I call that chatbot Charlie. So one named after, obviously, chatbot second, my son, who tended to, uh, tended to waffle on a lot at the time. And um, that's where basically new years were found for AI. Chatbots became ubiquitous. Scheduling of interviews and meetings are automated, and, and video interviewing became, I suppose, uh, as as proliferated as as as, um, as face to face. So really, that's where we are at the moment in the recruitment sector. Uh, chatbots have become huge for companies on the company side. So, and they're using them basically to filter the candidates out of the application process. So, um, and obviously, this is a real challenge for any candidates, but particularly for um, fully employed people, because it basically rules them out of um, getting interviews and getting jobs. As the as general AI develops, and I suppose moves uh, up into uh, in, into uh, much more intelligent uh, and closer to general AI, I, I turn this terminator, and, and this is basically where there would be an augmentation of, of AI and recruiter. Um, this is, I suppose, talked about a lot at the moment within the HR tech and within the recruitment tech sectors, but isn't really uh, happening as yet because the technology hasn't developed uh, uh, far enough. Um, we are seeing what allows the, the technology to, I suppose, on the narrow AI side is, um, narrow AI side is uh, huge amounts of, of, of data and stronger and better algorithms and cloud computing have allowed that. Um, Final, uh, I suppose, scenario, as I termed it, was robot wars. And I suppose this is where, where AI and robots are making decisions about, about people. And I suppose uh, the key line in there is the second one, where AI decides whether humans or robots are more suitable for jobs. So if you think about it, you know, you, you have a, an organization and, and a piece of technology sitting at the middle of it, and it decides whether, whether we should hire people for the jobs or more robots for the jobs. Um, to give, I suppose, um, the audience uh, a quick look at, at what a what a chatbot looks like, a lot of people will have, um, you know, used this within insurance or and chatbots have become really uh, big. In, as someone mentioned this morning, in, in the customer service area, um, and effectively can sit either on uh, a website or on a Facebook Messenger or any messenger uh, platform like WhatsApp. And basically what happens is the, the bot has been trained, um, I suppose, to, to answer questions. And when I say trained, it's basically filled with questions, all the potential questions that, that someone could, can ask. Um, there is a lot of debate over whether people, uh, you know, interact well with this or want this type of service. Um, but we are certainly seeing across a lot of different sectors, particularly in recruitment, um, the recruitment sector, that a lot of people are happy to to deal with a with a chatbot. Um, in a lot of cases, they get a better they get a better customer experience. But it, it's in a lot of cases, it isn't a replacement for um, uh, for people. So if we just look, you can see as the as the questions are an, asked, um, the, um, the the chatbot then responds to to the person. And the really powerful thing about something like this is, if someone has applied for a job online um, and has uh, 
there isn't a job at that time, the system remembers them and then can offer up a job to that person at a, at a, at a future date, which is really, I suppose, um, uh, powerful and, and, you know, obviously includes, includes lots of people within the, uh, within the um, for future jobs. Um, in Taurus Nua, um, I suppose we, we break our customer guidance journey down into a number, uh, a number of different segments. And when we look at guidance, I suppose um, it's not, the, some people think of it as just a, a, a sort of a one-way conversation, but it certainly is a, 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 a two-way conversation across a lot of different parts of, of, of the journey. Um, and really for us, the first part is, is assessment. Um, and we have a, a distance travel tool we developed with the University of Sheffield um, for the job path service, which looks at uh, our, the customers um, and the unemployed person's barriers and their strengths um, across 10 different measures, um, including health, mental health, skills, uh, confidence, etc. And what we're trying to do is sort of see where, where someone is at that particular point in the journey. And that gives us, um, uh, I suppose, a realistic expectation of what the person uh, wants to do, uh, what they're capable at that moment in time, and what is going to stop them actually, you know, uh, moving into employment um, sooner rather than later. Um, we also, at that point, look at skills and transferable skills, um, which obviously in, in the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic is really, really important and is uh, critical for, I suppose, moving people into, um, into new sectors and, and uh, new jobs that they haven't worked in, worked in before. We just on, on the assessment piece, it, it, it is probably the most open to digitalization of the whole journey. Um, at this point, it, it's happened across, I suppose, as, as in Australia and, and other areas. Um, and but the second part of that, and sometimes it, it's it's not included in it together, but is that review um, of the assessment and, and the guidance. And really, we would see that as, as, as a person um, delivering that, uh, I suppose, uh, assessment in conjunction with the, with the unemployed person and working that through, looking at, I suppose, their goals, what they're trying to achieve in, in I suppose, in, in their journey and, and, and in their career. Um, intervention, so looking at all the different interventions across them um, that are required, whether they be uh, across skills um, mental health and health particularly. Um, obviously, most of those are, are a huge proportion of those are, 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 are currently delivered uh, by, by people and we believe in, in the short to medium term will definitely be um, carried out by, uh, by people. The next part of the, the journey um, on guidance is, is training and skills, and it's, it's a critical part of, uh, of what we do. Um, one of the key things when we, we, I suppose, invest in people in, with training and skills in Taurus Nua is looking at what, you know, in improving different parts of their, um, parts of their skill set. Um, and uh, obviously with, with COVID-19, classroom type training as people in Maynooks or most universities, colleges and, and uh, FET areas will, will uh, attest to uh, the, it's been a really challenging um, uh, time to try and deliver uh, really good training and, and skills improvement. And uh, we've invested in a product called Canvas, which is uh, used by by Harvard University, UCC for delivery of, of, uh, of training and uh, it's proved massively beneficial to allow us to deliver those, um, that type of training um, that is interactive um, and I'll talk about engagement in a second and but really uh, allows people to be involved in, in, in group sessions, has the security required in terms of, you know, uh, unlike things like Zoom where it, it's not really locked down and, and potentially ha can offer problems. Um, and also it has a measurement element to it. So you can see people, you know, through the journey and, and it allows to, to look at 
um, different milestones that people, as they move through, to ensure that they're getting the correct training and skills to help them into, uh, into employment. Colin, I'll just give you the two minutes uh, yeah. time. Alarm. Yeah, thank, thanks, okay. Melinda. Um, finally, in the journey, and I think this is one of the critical areas, uh, particularly at the moment, is around advocacy and uh, employer engagement. So when, I suppose, uh, people are, are, are unemployed, they're competing with, with, I suppose, people in employment for jobs. And employers uh, in Ireland and, and across Europe at the moment, moment are, are receiving 10 times as many uh, applications for jobs that they had that they had done pre-COVID. Um, so it's becoming much more difficult. And that advocacy role uh, and employer engagement role sits separately within, within Taurus Nua and allows us, I suppose, to promote um, our job seekers and, and customers uh, to employers and, and help them and help them across the line. Sending emails and and, uh, and I suppose the digitalization of this has been talked to for a while. Uh, there is digitalization of this on the employer side where they, they're using filtering technology, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but that advocacy piece is really critical uh, at the moment and, and is playing a really important part um, in, us, in us supporting people into employment. Um, I think what I would say at a, at a wider level really um, we are not seeing, or I'm not seeing, uh, the type of investments worldwide in, in, in this area in research um, that we are seeing in, I suppose, the recruitment and HR tech sectors. Uh, over $2 billion per year is invested in, in, in HR tech and, and recruitment technology. Um, and we're not really seeing that within, within, the, um, within the employability sector, uh, probably for a number of reasons. I, I think it's not as obviously as big a market. Um, but also, it's not really, I, th I think um, unemployment is not really seen as a sort of a sexy industry for, for, in, for investment. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's something all of us need to do is, you know, from, from the point of view of, of promoting uh, investment in the sector and ensuring, um, you know, people that can make a difference in this in terms of investment get involved to um, ensure that the, the right types of technology is developed, that it's ethical, as was, was talked about earlier. Um, ethical AI, there's huge conversations and, and challenges around it. Um, uh, in in different parts of uh, in different parts of the world, um, just in terms of uh, finally, really to say what we are looking at across all these areas is uh, engagement. So engagement with the customer, it's very very challenging to actually um, do or sort of implement any of these parts of the customer journey unless the the person and the unemployed person is engaged and that's the critical sort of thing we look for in any technology we use does it help us help the customer and does it help the customer be more engaged with the process and with the with the service um, we provide um, finally uh, we have a partner program um, mark davidson uh, heads that up on our side uh, he's uh, Australian. He's worked in the employability sector in, in Australia for over 15 years. So if anyone's interested in talking to us about, you know, working with us on technology or services we provide, if you get in touch with Mark, his details are on the screen and you know, I can share. Okay, thank you, Nella. That's great, Colin. Uh, thanks very much for that. Very interesting, fascinating. Uh, and I think engagement there on the last slide is is probably key to all of this. Um, how can we engage people um, or and how do they feel about being engaged in this type of uh, technology? So uh, that's fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Colin. Um, so we'll move on now to, um, to Bernadette Walsh from Careers Portal. Um, Bernadette, I don't know if you're able to share your screen there. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Brilliant. Um, it's great to have the opportunity to be part of this afternoon. So uh, thanks very much for the invite. So I'll just share my screen and get started. And hopefully you should be able to see that now, Nuala. Okay. Yeah, that's great, Brenda. Thanks, Nuala. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, so 15 minutes is a very short time, but just on that, if anybody is interested in linking in, my details will be on the last slide. And I know the slides 
um, and all the resources are going to be shared after this um, conference this afternoon. So you're very welcome to get in touch with me. So I suppose um, in the context of using digital tools in employment and guidance services, I am going to talk very much about from a practitioner, but also from a stakeholder perspective. But I suppose just to put that in context, first of all, um, a lot of you may be very familiar with Careers Portal, but I never assume that people are. So I might just give you a very, very brief introduction um, a bit of context around maybe who we are, first of all, before I bring you to particular digital tools that we've been working on for the past number of years now in collaboration with, with many stakeholders. So just a very brief piece about Careers Portal. Then I might talk about the development of My Future Plus, which is a bespoke, if you like, adult guidance career management system and how that supports, if you like, remote evidence-based career guidance provision and practice. And then finally, just to take you to the client or the job seeker career file um, and how, the, how it's so integrated and mobile compatible and how that all comes together. So, okay, just a little bit about Careers Portal to begin. So Careers Portal um, was developed um, as a direct response um, to a report back in 2007 by the expert group on future skills needs and it re recommended in that report that Ireland develop a centralised career guidance portal or if you like a one-stop shop because information tended to be fragmented when it came to careers information tools and resources. So the site was officially launched in 2008 and to, today now it's completely mobile compatible and completely free to everybody um, and it ranges for resources from second level, post-primary, right through lifelong guidance um, and education. So I suppose um, it is a busy site and we'll talk about that very shortly. So we do have um, a huge user or audience, if you like, and we serve six main kind of communities. So essentially the site has grown exponentially and it's nearly like six websites within a website because of our user range. So we've been asked back in, I suppose, 2009, we launched the Reach Plus programme, which is a second level um, guidance programme for guidance counsellors and their students. Um, and since then, we were consistently asked, particularly in the adult sector, could we do the same for, you know, um, I suppose those outside of mainstream education? So really anybody 16 plus who was maybe linked in um, in terms of careers education in a FET centre, for example, but also if you were linked in with a key worker or a guidance worker. Um, and so we began to look at developing something similar for REACH, obviously outside of post-primary, that would be more appropriate. Um, and we began thinking about My Future Plus, which I'll be talking about. So just before I move to that, um, sometimes people wonder because there is so much information and it's all Irish contextualised information on Careers Portal. So we are very much working very closely with over 200 public and private organisations. And that's really to integrate the most up to date and useful careers and educational information. So we profile over 33 sectors in the Irish economy. We house the National Occupational Database, which has over a thousand occupations, and we integrate within that skills shortages, live jobs. Um, it's a very busy site, as I've already mentioned, over 4 million page impressions a month and approximately 2 million visitors a year. So I suppose that leads me to my future plus. So it is such a busy website that for an already overwhelmed job seeker or client arriving to the site, sometimes it can be just too much. So the idea of, um, I suppose, developing a bespoke adult guidance resource was the idea that it would bring everything into one page or career file for the job seeker or the client. Um, so it is quite innovative in that anybody can go on to Careers Portal and use it, but this is um, a, it's a very innovative career guidance management system in that it links the client's file or the job seeker's career file to a guidance administration. And I'll talk about the different contexts in which it is being used um, and rolled out. Um, but it's always been underpinned by a very collaborative stakeholder kind of an action research approach 
and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So I suppose the first pilot study that we began on My Future Plus was back actually in September 2015 when we formed the very first My Future Advisory Board. And that really was representatives from key stakeholders across kind of the PES services. So that included, um, you know, the then Department of Social Protection, the Employment Services, but also um, we linked in with Adult Education Guidance Services and Youth Reach. So we were looking at the needs of adult guidance. Um, so we didn't want to just go off and develop something that we thought would work on the ground. We wanted to really link in and have that stakeholder engagement from both practitioners, but also for, from their clients and their job seekers. So um, what was really interesting about that as well is we engaged with guidance professionals in further education and training, but also educators as well. So those involved in the delivery of work experience modules, career planning and prep and so on. Because I suppose the premise is career, careers learning is happening in lots of different contexts and lots of different ways. Um, I suppose this career decision making then is, is always really helpful when we're linked in and supported by somebody, be it a guidance counsellor, guidance professional um, and so on. So I'll give a little bit more detail about that. So the, the first, if you like, advisory group was, was um, formed back in 2015. We had a first version uh, ready by the January, which was a phenomenal achievement at the time. And then based on the feedback and so on, we actually launched the first version back in August 2016. So I actually um, based my own master's research on the development of My Future Plus. And I've just linked to it if anybody has an interest in looking at the findings of that study. But the title of that was Collaboration, Innovation and Integration. And it was very much an action research study of the development of this new ICT career learning tool, which we call My Future Plus. OK, there was also another pilot in collaboration, Careers Portal and, and the National Centre for Guidance Education collaborated back in 2017 and we ran a pilot for a year and that was across BET guidance provision, if you like. So that included the Adult Education Guidance Services, Youth Reach, Community Training Centres and also PLC colleges. And again, the idea was to review the current My Future Plus and you know, take very much a collaborative approach to that engagement so that my future would be improved and developed and respond to emerging needs of, of guidance practitioners, but also careers, uh, those involved in careers education. Um, so again, very reflective of a kind of an action research approach. Um, and that is really a process of collaboration. Um, and there was a lot of reflection, review, um, and you know, very quick improvements were integrated in as a result of that. But it was very much all, all about dialogue from, you know, with, with stakeholders from an Irish perspective. So the article I've linked in there as well, if you're interested in having a look at that. So in terms of where we're at since then, so um, we've always continued to consult collaborate and actually deliver you know workshops and, and cpd on my future plus so at the moment in terms of the landscape and who's using it it's still very much if you like um in its infancy in comparison to you know reach plus but we've had huge developments particularly since since march to try and respond to remote guidance practice needs um, so we've all been catapulted now, not just into looking at tools or an integrated guidance approach, but more so in terms of how do we continue our work effectively with, with clients, if you like job seekers, customers, um, effectively and in a supportive manner. So at the moment, in terms of um, PES services, we've local employment services, jobs clubs and partnership um, staff using My Future Plus in terms of the FET or further education and training. We've got AGS, MLN, adult and community education groups, and they also include disability and mental health, health, mental health services, sorry. I've just given one example there of the Cope Foundation, um, Youth Reach is um, you know, very much nationwide, PLC and CTCs as well. Um, and also it's being used in terms of private practice, and um, there's a huge need, um, uh, you know, in, in to, to, 
in terms of private practitioners um, using my future plus and also in coaching and psychological support services so i've just given some examples there so rugby players ireland sport ireland and, and private practitioners so i suppose just to make the differentiation that it is being used in, in many contexts but what i'm always very clear about is the role of the professional that that's using my future in that context so for example we have work experience and um, levels four five and six completely integrated into my future plus teachers can give even feedback to their learners and it's pre proved hugely successful actually in lockdown where we had uh, many eas and um, you know having access to learners portfolios and approving them as a result and um, so lots of positive feedback on that if people are interested and i have a link to the newsletter at the end of this slide so i suppose since march then there was a huge shift again you know my future plus has been used in a very integrated or blended way you know some of the feedback we've had is that particularly in remote areas it was given guidance practitioners that reach that they wouldn't have had before where clients may not have come into their services and they were engaging with them in a blended way now maybe over the phone checking in with them they can see exactly what their clients have done they have a profile on every single client or job seeker so it was really um you know that process of collaboration with your clients um but you know since march we haven't had that so we were looking at ways of coming up with new developments that would support remote adult guidance practice and careers education practice so we um we built a new client or learner or job seeker messaging feature and um, we also um, went live there very recently with a career sectors or assessment um, app and what that does is particularly if you've lost your job in a sector that's been completely disseminated it will give you ideas around what other sectors how you can transfer your you know your natural inclination for different sectors to maybe a new sector that you haven't thought about but just to say all of our um self-assessments and tools which i'll be just probably get a minute to really quickly show you they're strengths based they're designed to build confidence to really help people tune into what skills that they have well developed and how for example they may be transferred to another sector we also went live with a new client notes or records so in a completely secure platform and um, you know people working remotely now staff members you know for, in terms of gdpr everything can be housed in a very secure um context and you know client notes shouldn't be kept in your home for example and so on so it is very much evidence-based remote practice that we're, we're very mindful of at the moment so in terms of the theme of leave no one behind just a couple of points um i make on that that my future is supporting development of digital literacy so it is completely mobile compatible for example so uh, there's no need for for um, a laptop or a mainframe or desktop computer it's very accessible and very intuitive it's being built specifically for mobile device and um, so i suppose you know we really need to be cognizant that all job search if you like has moved online now and if we don't support our clients to try and develop their digital literacy they will become further disenfranchised so we need to be really mindful of that too and um, just give you the uh, two minutes yeah. there Bernadette okay so I'll fly through the rest of this and just show you maybe one or two live screenshots but um just in terms of it is a new channel to deliver um, activation very much supported activation job search supports um, it is as i've mentioned um, strengths based holistic and the idea that the client can be self-directed by using my future plus but it's an opportunity for collaboration you know guidance is very much about uh, a meaning making approach with to your to your clients understanding of themselves what are they learning about themselves in relation to career and how can they find their best fit with the world of work and education going forward um okay and then the other interesting thing is just to say very quickly in terms of an ecosystem or a joint up approach to pez the client can migrate their career file from service to service so that's just that's it it's quite innovative in ireland normally information for job seekers
with the dream services and so on. So there are challenges that we're mindful of as well. And, um, you know, sometimes practitioners feel that these tools are, there's a reductionist maybe approach, but that's not what we're suggesting is they can be used very effectively. And we've all the research to, to back that up in terms of our stakeholder engagement to say that they only complement your practice, they're not designed to replace and that there, we are very cognizant there are very, you know, people that are very distant from the labour market who their digital literacy is compromised um, and they need support around that and even in terms of, of maybe internet access or connection. Um, I'm conscious of the, um, the, the panel as well that we have here and we are also aware that we, we need to, to, to make, you know, it is as accessible as possible. Um, and we're looking at that and actually we're, we're looking at the whole accessibility of, of My Future Plus. I'm just going to very quickly show you um, one or two screens and, and then I'm going to um, hand back to you, Nuala. So just very quickly, just let me know if you can see the homepage of Careers Portal. I'm just going to log in and just show you um, what a, 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 My Future Administration looks like and what a client file looks like. So hopefully you can see my screen coming through nice and clear there. So in terms of the career file and what it looks like, you can see that everything is on one page here, that it's, it's kind of broken into three key areas. So all of the apps that relate to self-assessment, they're strengths-based, they're not psychometric-based, they're designed to build confidence and help people find a good fit with the world of work and education. Just on that, we have things like jobs and demand. So the current Irish labour market, and um, what are those jobs? What are those opportunities that exist? And um, so they're very much integrated in as well. So you'll see that off just very quickly show you that one. So there's 98 skills shortages at the moment. They range in levels of education and training. You'll see our job zones indicate those. Um, but one of the things um, people are often surprised by is, um, First of all, we have a personal action plan. So in the absence of being able to face-to-face -face build one with a client, the client can actually, if they're in a position to do so, input things like their education, previous experience and so on. And when I scroll to the end of the client file, you'll actually see that based on where I'm logged in, um, I'm kind of between Dublin, Kildare and so on. It's pulling in the jobs, live jobs in my particular area. How that all gets tied up and what makes it unique is it's a career management system. So as a practitioner, I have a profile um, or a guidance worker, a profile on every single client. And if I just demonstrate here and I'm going to finish them, sorry if I've got a minute over, is that I have a profile on every single client. I can put in my notes that I mentioned here. I have a template in terms of good practice in, 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 in looking at people may have um, and obviously it's recommended in keeping with with you know GDPR and um, it's fully secure but that people are, are cognizant of recommendations around good practice around note keeping and um, but you'll see that everything the client has done in their file is integrated in there's a personal action plan or an ILP it's called in some instances and I can put in notes and I have full access to all this clients self-assessments any research that they've done in terms of career and also we have a feature in here and I'll end now is that the client can also add in courses including fetch which you actually can't tag fetch courses on the fetch website but we've be built a me mechanism in which they can do so so thanks very much for your attention I'm going to stop my share and again on the slide you're very welcome to come along to any of our workshops they're freely available and they're running um, a couple of times a week Thanks very much, Bernadette. That was a fascinating quick stop tour of uh, My Future Plus. Um, I think there's lots of interesting features in there that um, guidance practitioners, I'm sure, will be very interested in. Um, for me, the strengths based assessments and I suppose being able to uh, engage with your clients in a more meaningful way, particularly during this current uh, COVID era that we're living through. So, thank you so much, Bernadette. Uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions uh, in a little while. So I'd just like to remind um, uh, our attendees, uh, all participants today, please do ask questions, put them in the Q&A, and we'll get a chance to ask, uh, to pose those questions to the presenters later on. Uh, so thank you, Bernadette. So I'm just going to hand over now 
to the panel. I think we'll just go straight into the panel. Um, so um, we have Paul McSweeney um, from Forza. So Paul, if you want to unmute and you can, you can turn on your video, um, that would be fantastic. Great, okay, thank you. Brilliant, thanks Paul. Okay. Yeah, uh, th thanks. And uh, yeah, I suppose I'll just um, give a bit of an outline in, in relation to, to Forza uh, background and then a bit on, on digitalization in the public employment services. Uh, Forza has uh, 80,000 members um, across the public and private sector. We're a new union. We started up in, in 2018. It's uh, an amalgamation of impact uh, PSEU and, and CPSU and um, we, uh, we're across the education sector, health, local authorities, uh, non-commercial semi-state bodies, commercial semi-state bodies, the voluntary sector uh, and the civil service and, and, and the private sector as well. Um, in uh, DESP uh, we have, uh, uh, there's 6,000 staff in the department and force would represent uh, four and a half thousand uh, of those and, and that's everybody from uh, if anybody's aware of the intro centres it'll be the service officer who you meet when you go in the door the clerical officer executive officer at the uh, the, the counters the intro centre manager community welfare officers uh, the social welfare inspectors we also represent uh, medical assessors and of course the, the case officers as well um, the main customer interaction uh, with which uh, the customers have with with uh, DSP uh, would be well face to face is through the intro centres and there's over uh, sixty intro centres uh, across uh, across the country um, and um, certainly uh, the department has been extremely busy uh, because of uh, of COVID and and we've seen. A rise in uh, the unemployment rates from uh, less than five percent uh, prior to um, uh, to the pandemic uh, to to fifteen percent currently when when uh, adjusted for uh, for for the people who are on uh, COVID uh, and uh, that that put an awful lot of pressure uh, on on members uh, in, in the department and it led uh, to a cessation for for a while of uh, the, the activation role uh, as, as people went into to other roles uh, to ensure that the pandemic unemployment payments uh, were, were paid uh, uh, as quickly as possible uh, to, to, to members who lost their, their, their jobs. Um, the, the activation service has, has reopened up uh, now in, in the department and there's a commitment from the government under the July stimulus uh, package uh, to enhance public employment service uh, capacity across the intro system and including contracted services to ensure that all unemployed job seekers have access to employment advisor and our, our case officer. Um, and I suppose uh, in, in for us, uh, the, the, the grading of those case officers, that there's no downgrading uh, in, in the type of work that they do is, is important to us and we're in discussions uh, with the with the department around the numbers uh, that will be coming in into the intro centres. Uh, in, in terms of digitalisation, um, force our, ourselves have no difficulty with it uh, once it doesn't lead uh, to uh, the the overall loss of jobs. Uh, there there absolutely will be job displacement uh, through digital. And we've seen that, but what we have managed to do, and, and the revenue model in the revenue commissioners is, is a good example, uh, that uh, staff have been reskilled and upskilled uh, so that they've been able to do other work uh, in, in that department. Uh, so they've moved uh, from clerical roles, roles where, where uh, suppressed, and uh, people would have moved into to audit and, and compliance areas as well. And, and certainly that's the kind of discussion that we've had uh, with uh, the Department of Social Protection in, in relation to digitalization and, and the impact that it would, would have on our members. Of course, what's very important to, to us and to the department is that uh, quality customer service uh, isn't negatively impacted uh, through, through the introduction of, of digitalization, 
and the point that's been made by a lot of, uh, of contributors already is around access to the services and the digital we provide uh, and ensuring uh, that, that people, for whatever reason, whether it's uh, poor broadband, uh, whether they're not uh, digitally literate, whether they have uh, other issues or, or they just want to use uh, paper-based uh, claims, that they're not left behind and that there's uh, supports uh, for them and, and, and that's constantly being kept uh, under discussion. Um, I suppose the big thing that's happening in um, in GESP at the moment, uh, and it, it's more a, a, a back office uh, than a public employment service front office facing digitization is, is around the establishment of a centralized processing unit, uh, which uh, will uh, basically uh, lead to the majority of uh, job seeker uh, claims and that being done online. Uh, again, this has all been uh, fast forwarded by the, uh, the, the current pandemic uh, where um, the pop payments and, and the claims uh, have been predominantly uh, done online and uh, now we're, we, we've, we've got around to, to uh, looking at the establishment of a centralised processing unit and um, the only concerns we have on that is that we'd like to ensure that uh, there's still a local link uh, to local communities uh, through through the intra centres as well, and that a, a centralised processing doesn't take uh, that kind of local link away too much, uh, and and we would hope uh, that through the job job stimulus package uh, and through more activation staff in in local intra centres that they, they still remain uh, relevant uh, in 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 the local communities. Um, I should. Uh, I should also say that I suppose um, in, in terms of uh, the digitization in the public employment service in GSP, uh, that's uh, been operating on the, uh, the probability of exit or the, the, the PECS to, uh, and uh, that uh, assesses uh, the, the, the likelihood of customers, uh, whether they exit unemployment, whether their likelihood is, is high, medium or, or low. Uh, and uh, earlier contributors talked about uh, the kind of self-service that the customer should have the choice whether they want to uh, interact with, with, with care officers or not. Uh, and certainly in the, in the case of those who are high on PECs and who are likely to get a job, uh, there isn't a requirement uh, on them to, to interact with case officers. That's a, a choice that they have. And that allows, uh, by using that tool, it allows case officers uh, to, to provide more time uh, for the medium and, and, and those who are, who are considered uh, less likely uh, to, to uh, get a job uh, without those supports. So I suppose just to, to, to finish off, um, we support digitization uh, once it, 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 uh, it, it continues to, to provide the, the quality service. It, it protects uh, our members' jobs. Uh, and uh, our, our allows our members to, to get into to higher quality jobs uh, through uh, reskilling and, and upskilling. Okay, thank you. That's great, Paul. Thanks so much for that input. Um, so we'll, I'm sure, have some questions for you uh, after the panel uh, finishes. So thank you for that. So I'll call on Breed O'Brien then from the INOU um, to share your. Uh, to, to uh, start your video and unmute. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you very much to, to Nuala and Mary for the invite to, uh, to speak this afternoon. It's been a very interesting day, I must say. Um, I mean, one of the things, that w w the whole, this whole area of you know, the use or the increased use of digital tools in activation um, or in the provision, which I kind of I think a more constructive way of putting it, the provision of a public employment service, regardless of who's maybe delivering it, be it the state itself through intro, be it out in the community through the local employment service, the jobs clubs, employability, the SICAP program, be it through the private for profit sector, um, job path providers, or indeed I noticed uh, you know that now the first new or a social enterprise, um, regardless of who is delivering it, you know, just in one of the critical pieces for us is the whole area of choice. And I've been just struck throughout the day, 
particularly when Joe Ingle this morning talked about, you know, how people would be will be referenced. The reality is for most people who are unemployed in receipt of a job seekers payment. They really don't have much choice about engaging with the system. It is expected of them and they can find themselves in difficulty if they don't. Um, and what ideally what we would love to see is a public employment service that's accessible to everybody of working age, regardless of whether they meet the ILO's definition of unemployment or not, regardless of whether or not they're in receipt of a welfare payment, just that if people wish to need to need those supports that they can indeed access a public employment service. A couple of figures from the recent Labour Force survey I just think are quite striking. These are figures where no adjustment has been made for COVID, yet the impact of COVID is quite visible, but also they capture the labour market challenge that faces us once you move beyond that very tight definition of unemployment, which is that somebody who's been actively seeking work in the past four weeks is available to take up work in the next two weeks. So the principal economic status, which anybody fills out the census is familiar with, that went up by over 100, by about 100, actually more than doubled over the past year. It's now 275,000 plus. It was a little under 110,000 in the same quarter a year ago. The potential additional labour force, which captures people who are inactive, who are unemployed, who are working part-time, but see themselves as underemployed, so very much people who would like more work, other things been equal. And um, that has gone up to over 273,000 people, was a little over 127,000 people a year ago. And the participation rate is now at 58.9. And the lowest it went during the last crisis was 61.1. .1. So again, I think just those figures for me just highlight the challenge that is facing us that COVID has created, that, that the, the, the damage that the health crisis has done to the labour market. So then for me, that then raises questions of how do you provide a public employment service? How do you provide supports to people? And what role then does, could digital, digital platforms play? Anybody who's received a public, uh, uh, the, the, pand the pandemic unemployment payment, if all went well for them, and it did for most people, thankfully, they applied maybe, they had applied by Thursday of one week, it was in their bank account by Tuesday the following week. That's in stark contrast to most people who receive a welfare payment, and particularly anybody receiving a job seekers payment. But then there's that whole issue of how then does the system then engage with them to provide them with employment supports. Um, and then how for those to whom genuinely seeking work criteria apply, as they do for people in receipt of a job seekers payment, and increasingly for people in receipt of a, a pandemic unemployment payment, how then do pe are people really supported to exercise choice? I really enjoyed Bernadette's presentation just in terms of Career Portal and My Future Plus. I just thought that was, was really interesting. During the last crisis, we had certainly hoped that the whole area of computing might help with the whole matching question which sometimes can be hit and miss if you have staff on the ground providing a service for whom maybe this is not something that they have been fully trained in. Um, and, you know, so there, there are challenges there. Um, but then some the, the research that's emerged over recent years, again, just then throws up questions. And I was really struck by Ludo's point this morning around just, you know, the, the accuracy improves but the reality of the discrimination becomes even more stark. And they were concerns that were raised through a, a project we've been doing recently around the whole area of decent work, where people raised concerns around, you know, computers filtering out and blocking people. And that's been raised by the speakers this afternoon. And that's creating new barriers. The, the fact that people don't necessarily have the wherewithal to access online services, that has become very stark when people have tried to finish training programs. There's only so much you can do in a mobile phone. Um, and, and after that, really to, to engage comfortably, you do need uh, uh, other, other equipment at your disposal. And there may be a safe space, a quiet space to learn. And I think that also applies for applying for a job because applying for a job is a job in itself. And some people are very good at that, others aren't. So the whole issue of confidence comes up 
with us regularly. It's raised by individual unemployed people. It's raised by our affiliates who provide services on the ground. The confidence to engage, the confidence to go out and seek work, and which can be very difficult when you keep getting knocked back and knocked back and knocked back. And I was very struck by then some of the inputs this morning talking about how quickly sanctions are applied in a more automated system. Now that does nothing for people's confidence. It does nothing in terms of supporting people to be able to find work. And then you end up with a situation that also was flagged this morning where employers get lots and lots of lots of applications. And all that happens, and recruitment firms will say this, that if people are, are perceived to be applying without a focus, a lot of employers will go, oh, okay, there's your one again. And before you even have a chance, and in fact, this might be the job that you might be suitable for, but they've seen you too often and at this stage they've discounted you. So I think there are real challenges there in a more automated system. And that can really make actually trying to progress very difficult for people. And that unfortunately, instead of some of these tools maybe having the, 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 the capacity to address the discriminations that can arise when people interact and people make assumptions about each other because of maybe where you're from, your accent, your, your, your ethnicity, uh, the fact that you have an addiction, that you have a mental health problem, your gender, the fact that you're parenting alone, that you have a disability. Um, that unfortunately, instead of AI and AI-assisted delivery and increased digitalization maybe helping to address some of those barriers, there does unfortunately seem to be a reality that there is our inbuilt prejudice into some of the algorithms underpinning these uh, programs and that in fact inequality will be further deepened and become a much starker issue to be addressed. So that is one of the very much the big concerns that we would have. How do, you, how do we make these tools work for people, particularly for people who are more distant from the labour market, particularly for people who maybe do not have the wherewithal to use these tools easily, or for whom maybe that just right now, where they are and where these tools are, are two different uh, 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 nearly two different planets, I think, at times. And then the other concern I would have, is there, a, I, and I'm posing this as a question to, 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 to us all, is there a danger that then those who do not have the wherewithal to engage with the system digitally and who continue to use the face-to-face -face services, will they sort of be seen, and to use an awful word, and a word I absolutely detest, will they, will they find themselves in the unemployable, category and the kind of oh yeah we'll get around to them the group that often we only the groups we only often start to talk about when we get to full employment and then who invariably get pushed to the back when a crisis hits and um, and there's a real danger that i just think that some of these developments could make some of those dynamics even more stark and that we really need to ensure that in addressing these issues and looking at at, at, at what these what these tools could do that human rights equality and social inclusion are built into them so that they really do help those more distance from the labor market to be able to access a decent job and it does not end up that they find themselves even further excluded uh, particularly from a work that would allow them enjoy economic independence and i'll leave it at that thank you very much that's great, Breed. Thanks so much for that input. Uh, lots of points. I think you covered a whole range of issues there that we can um, definitely come back to in a few minutes. Thanks, Breed. So next up is Joan O'Donnell uh, from Freedom Tech. Um, so Joan, if you'd like to uh, turn on your video and unmute. Okay. Um, well, first of all, uh, Mary and Nuala, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak um, this afternoon. Um, and it's great to come straight after Breed because Breed has articulated uh, so many of the concerns that we'd have from a freedom tech perspective. Um, I think it's true to say that uh, we really do need to reimagine what a public employment service looks like in the 21st century. Um, we have a very new set of circumstances that have um, visited upon us with um, COVID. And 
uh, aligning with that is this surge in AI capability, um, algorithms, et cetera, et cetera, and all the risks that they pose. And at the same time, I'm with a project called Freedom Tech, which is a collaboration between the Disability Federation of Ireland and Able Ireland. And we, for a number of years now, have been advocating very strongly for the introduction of um, an assistive technology ecosystem. And assistive technology over time has become accessible technology as more and more um, mainstream technologies have been developed that will actually answer to that gap between where people and how people access services and what their actual needs are. So we're very much in favor of putting the technology in the hands of the user just as much as the, the service provider. So when we're looking at how we reimagine um, digital employment service in the context where we've got um, increase, placing increasing value on human rights and Ireland has ratified the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities and so on. We need to look much more broadly at what digitalization is about, what its potential is, and also um, what it's trying to achieve. Um, I think Bree speaks very clearly when she was speaking about the degree to which a lot of cohorts um, of our, our population have been left outside and left behind in the, in the quest towards work. And yet I note in the Take the High Road or the High Road Back to Work report um, developed by Musi in earlier on this year, the, there's great attention given to the psychological effects and benefits of work. And yet we also have reports that say that um, not working has detrimental effects on the mental health of people with disabilities. And yet we've we've very conveniently ignored that. So on top of a disability, you've got compounding effects. And I think nobody is left without skin in the game here somehow, now that we've got COVID and we're all experiencing the exacerbated effects of, of um, working from home where our, our where jobs still still exist or not working and being at home and and homeschooling etc cetera, etc cetera. and how that has knock-on effects on how we all are and how we are doing and yet somehow it's been okay to leave people with disabilities sitting in that space in good times and in bad so for, for those reasons alone i would say that we're hoping that the digitalization of the public um, employment service might offer the opportunity if done right to develop a more level playing field because at the moment just you know pre-covid figures obviously 20 percent of those in work have a disability compared to 48 percent in europe we're not doing very well here and a report that was um uh, that's being worked on by eurofound the european agency on living and um, working conditions is saying clearly that um you know th they're publishing this report early next year, but they've done an Irish case study saying that the strategies um, that are there to support people with disabilities into work, such as the comprehensive employment strategy, are not effective. So very much here, people have paid, people with disabilities have paid a heavy price for the strategies that we've had to date. And we've been sitting on the on the edges waiting for something to happen and hopefully that there is opportunity in this crisis in terms of um, digitalization and um, the collaboration um, that i've been working on around freedom tech is advocating very much to put technology in the hands of service users of all services whether you're using and accessing a public appointment service whether you're accessing a uh, disability day services, whether you're accessing um, school or, or college, that you actually have the means to use technology to get to where you need to go to do what it is that you need to do in your day. And that you have ownership of that technology so that you can move seamlessly from school to work or from school to college, etc. And we have advocated for this and for an AT passport um, since 2016. 
which would look at not only the procurement of specialist equipment, um, and that comes under public sector duty in Ireland, that um, uh, accessibility features, etc., must be taken into account, but also that we have clear service provision around technologies that are available, because how else are people to access a digitalized service? Um, and during that period, unfortunately, we've seen the shutting down and the closing down of um, a citizen's information board run information service that's, that, that gives people information on what technologies are out there that might actually support them to get on with their, their daily lives and to access the services that they're looking for. Um, so we need funding and a, a proper procurement process that will actually enable an ecosystem. We've been talking about an ecosystem um, around technology um, for people with disabilities, um, just as much as an, e an ecosystem of public um, employment services is required. And that that would include assessment and training and follow on, etc., as well. Because we can have all the beautiful apps um, that we need, and yet, unless we've got access to them, and unless that interface between people and services is actually dealt with, then people with disabilities end up right back at the back of the queue as before. And that is something that no life can afford to happen a second time and a third time around as we've gone through various um, economic cycles over the last 10 or 15 years. So I leave it there and I look forward to um, contributing to the rest of this discussion. Thanks, Neil. That's great, Joan. Thanks so much for that input. Um, definitely have to support your comments on the, uh, the mental health effects of unemployment and how it's often not on the agenda at all. Um, uh, so again, points that we can come back to there um, in the discussion. Um, so finally, our final speaker on the panel is Helen from NALA. So Helen, if you'd like to uh, turn on your video. Great, thank you. Thanks, Nuala, and um, great to hear from everybody and hope to uh, give some contribution today from the perspective of um, adults with unmet literacy, numeracy and digital skills needs. So I suppose a couple of things um, to start with around um, really the barriers to participating in some of the services we've um, been presented on today. And people may be aware that the adult literacy statistic is one in six adults uh, will struggle with basic information. So if that's um, information to read on a website or if a leaflet or an interview or letter is posted, one in six adults won't be able to engage with that text. There's a rather large percentage of people then who will struggle also with digital skills. So that 55% of the adult population will struggle um, with that. And an underlying, um, when there are people with uh, digital skills, there's often an underlying literacy issue in there. So we have a huge concern that there are lots of barriers to participating um, within some of the, the guidance and the employment services. And we've been dealing and talking to, I suppose, lots of the services um, in Intrio and uh, linking in with Hubble and some of the, the public sector um, uh, people around this. And I suppose one of the key things, and Breed mentioned it, I think is choice. So it is extremely important that adults, first of all, who um, might be nervous about being in contact uh, and going online will be first of all, take that phone call and maybe have a, a discussion and a chat, whether it's the caseworker or the guidance person as to how they would like to engage with you at the minute in these COVID times. These are unusual and strange times where we can't put face to face as our initial contact. So we are have to start with the telephone and have a conversation and a discussion um, with the person around how we can uh, you know, link in with each other. And really then when we're looking at the, how are we going to engage um, people uh, who have unmet literacy and digital skills needs, there's sort of two, two areas looking at it. First of all, we need to provide upskilling opportunities for people to improve those skills. And if people saw recently in the program for government, there is a proposed new 10 year uh, adult literacy, numeracy and digital skills plan. And Minister Harris uh, launched that last week with a six month date to have it ready um, to go. So I think on that level, we're now continually trying to push and make sure that investment, there is a need for funding. It's a difficult place to be when we're looking for funding at the minute, but the literacy service um, caters for only 65,000 people 
but we have 520,000 people who struggle. So we have never prioritised this group of people uh, and we need to do that now. So we would be very much going with the UNESCO and the SDG goals, which would say we need to look at the furthest behind first. So if we can provide, and that is going to take time to try and um, build capacity of services to deliver more training to get people, um, you know, to, to have these skills to engage. So that's, that is one side of it. But while we're waiting to do that, and, and as I say, putting pressure for that to happen, sooner uh, rather than later. The second side, and it's the side that NALA works on, is around delivering literacy-friendly services. So many of the services that are out there really need to, and they have been, we've worked with many of them around areas like plain English um, and areas of how you engage with people. Um, it, 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 back to that thing about even a, a literacy-friendly, I, I spoke recently to uh, someone who said, how am I going to talk to someone on the phone uh, and ask them if they could read the letter that I sent them? So I said, well, you know, you, first of all, you, you, hello, you know, did you get the letter? So trying to, you talk to people as you would, have a chat. How was that letter for you? Was it clear? Did you understand what we're having a conversation with about today? Um, this may seem very simple, but it's amazing. We have gone the length and breadth of this country delivering training to interio staff, um, case officers. Uh, we've worked with local authority staff, people in the housing sections. That and nearly in one sense giving them uh, and a lot of this good practice is happening so i would say that it, there is a lot of good practice but just acknowledging um, and giving people the permission mm -hmm. to be okay with asking those type of questions it's about your tone and it's about how you say these things is extremely important so engaging with people as i mentioned is, is key and then the second piece really we've done an awful lot of work but we need a lot more is plain english so what information have you now posted out or what is your website looking like uh, is it written in plain English? And we're getting better, but we are by no means there. Uh, and lots of our work over the years are working with services like Intrio and like the Department of Health, trying to make sure that their, their letters and their information is coming out, at least that it's clear. So if that, that's a start. Now, if somebody struggles then with reading and understanding that, then that's a separate conversation that, again, as I say, through uh, telephone or where some face-to-face -face meetings might happen, you can try and work out if people need support. So really, that's it. There's a barrier that are there for us, and we're conscious of raising, constantly raising the awareness that many people out there are going to struggle to access your services. Um, and then what can we do to do that? Because I think, again, inequality was raised. That's our biggest concern. This group of people where the investment is not there to improve your literacy and numeracy and hasn't been in a great amount, uh, they were left there when times were good and bad again. And here we are now asking, can you prioritize the furthest behind first so that we can go and engage on the skill level and try and support people to improve the skills. And then on the other side, the, the other side is about working with services to make sure the services are literacy friendly, deliver things in plain English and um, so on. That's great, Helen. Thanks so much for that. Thank you. Okay, so some great um, presentations there, um, some comments and remarks from each of the, the panelists. Um, so we have some questions um, that maybe if all the panelists want to um, be available to answer perhaps. Um, but I suppose for me, just one of the key uh, themes that has come out just so far across the has to be the theme of engagement. And it seems that everybody has mentioned this, uh, ensuring that uh, engagement is possible um, for, for uh, job seekers, uh, for people accessing services, but also, of course, for people working in those public services, um, that they um, can still provide the quality and level of service, and that digitalizing some of that won't reduce the quality of service that's available. Um, so I'm just going to uh, try and get my questions up here. Um, I hope that you can still see me okay. Um, so maybe just one of the questions that came up um, that might be a useful one to start with. Uh, and this is really for, um, I think, both um, Colin and Bernadette in particular, um, that there's a lot of reference to guidance and perhaps the panelists would like to define guidance and what they mean by guidance um, and if this you know maybe for um, Colin uh, the staff assisting people most distant from the labor market um, how do they 
I suppose, use uh, some of the digital technologies that he's been talking about in terms of delivering that guidance. So I'll post that for uh, Bernadette and Colin if they'd like to come in. Maybe Bernadette first. Hey, can you hear me okay, Newell, and see me? Yeah, yeah, you're good. Okay, I suppose um, when I talk about guidance, um, it's very much from a guidance counselling perspective. But I suppose in general, I'm very cognizant of there's a, there's a, you know, people in different roles, for example, case officers and, um, you know, guidance workers in terms of the LES services. Um, but guidance really is about trying to support people at its very basic level to try and, you know, take meaningful steps forward and to have some kind of a meaningful engagement um, in, in society. Obviously, work is part of that, but so is lifelong learning. Um, so it's really, I suppose, in terms of my understanding um, and my, my personal belief system, it is very much about supporting the individual to move forward in their lives, but in, in a very much in a holistic way. So very often, I mean, what helps me think about guidance is I often refer to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So until, you know, people's basic needs are met, maybe they're not ready for a job, you know? So um, that often assists me in, in if, when I'm working with clients face to face or in a blended way or more recently remotely. So I might just hand over to Colin now. Brilliant. So Colin, if you want to come in there. Uh, thanks. Yeah, sorry, you can't see me there, can you? Um, yeah, look, I agree with Bernadette. I, I think, as as I explained really in the in the last more or less last slide there, in terms of um, our approach in Torres New to in from a guidance perspective is is split into a number of different areas, um, from the assessment and the review of the assessment through to I suppose the, the skills, training and intervention piece, then through to advocacy and they they take different, I suppose, skills really from a from the advisor perspective or the guidance um perspective. Um different people, I suppose, are suited to different parts of that journey, engagement with employers, you know, so um really there's there's a number of different skill sets required. And I noticed a couple of questions around um I suppose education, etc., for 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 staff, and I think it's really critical. We invest massively in that area. We have a full L and D team that works across um, uh, the whole organisation. We we have technology uh, called Bridge, which uh, in structure deliver for us with learning and development, um, and we we look to uh, you know I suppose deliver those services. And to our to our customers in a really sort of end to end way, but I think from a guidance perspective, it's it's about supporting people into into employment. And if they don't reach an employment or, or distance travel tool, um, Catalyst allows us to sort of identify, you know, how they've progressed along the way. And you know, not everyone actually goes back into employment, and, and we understand that. But it's supporting them along that journey, looking at the barriers that you know um, that they have. I suppose the strengths really strengths based based approach and you know supporting them uh, along the way and I, I just get a bit worried when people talk about you know um you know short term and long term unemployed I think anyone that comes into a, a sort of a, an activation service or into a, a guidance sort of service needs to be looked at as an individual um and treated as an individual because someone who's out of out of employment six months due to COVID or whatever can have, I suppose, severe barriers as, you know, Bridge mentioned earlier on there around confidence. It's a, it's a critical area and there's no timeline really for confidence. It's not a three year thing or a five year thing. Someone can be out of employment a month, a day, a week, and their individual circumstances can have a, a severe and damaging impact on them. And I think everyone needs to be looked at as an individual, not as a, not as a, a sort of a, a group or a, or a cohort. I think it's great, Colin. Thank you. Um, just to, maybe another one that's come in here. Um, what proposals are there to assist long-term unemployed, early school leavers, digitally challenged and literacy challenged clients of our services uh, of the LES in Trio Terms Newa um, job path to access or avail of digitalized supports and AI? So that's from, from Mary O'Dee in the LES. Um, 
and maybe also just to, to connect to that what type of expertise are, exists in using these types of processes to make assessments in the area of mental health or health so these are all the kinds of barriers i suppose that uh, our panelists have spoken about but uh, have you colin or bernadette any sense of um, proposals that may kind of you know provide that extra support when the, the barriers are particularly significant maybe colin while you're on there maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was just really taken, you know, um, with Helen's input earlier on digital skills and literacy. Um, and I do think it's probably one of the most important areas at the moment. Um, and I think uh, I'd just like to compliment Nala on the work um, that they're doing. And in, in like, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, like, I joined up thinking is probably the wrong word, but I, I think there's huge investment required um, in in you know those those digital skills, particularly at the moment, um, uh, for people across all uh, types of jobs. You know, different levels. You know, we you know we have different levels of un un unemployment, etc. And and the, the people that Helen uh, outlined there, I think it's just uh, a, a massive area at the moment, and it's quite difficult to actually identify um you know funding for those areas and, and that and in tourist Nua where we have our own programs internally um but there's huge numbers of people we, we see coming in that require um you know uh, training in this area and you know to be upskilled in in these areas and uh i'm I've been, been honest i don't see anything really on the horizon on that and maybe the other participants have more of an insight into what coming down the track there, but I, I haven't seen any real concrete uh, proposals around that yet. Great, Colin, thank you. Bernadette, would you have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I agree with the point that Colin has made, um, and particularly in, in the extraordinary work that Nala has, you know, is doing and, and has done for many, many years on that front. I suppose I'm heartened by um, the new Minister Harris and his portfolio, and he seems to be making great strides particularly focusing on digital literacy um, and he seems very, very tuned in in terms of those that are potentially um, most disenfranchised. So um, I know they're very recently in collaboration with Solus and they're looking at a whole um, six month project um, in terms of digital literacy and so on. So, I mean, I think, you know, we've had a change in leadership um, and I'm you know, I'm kind of watching closely. Um, th I mean, there's huge amount of, of work to be done, particularly um, in terms of, I mean, back in January when the Leave No One Behind um, conferences uh, were kind of taking place around the country, we were looking at, there was a huge focus on those that were most marginalised from um, the labour market. And I suppose, um, again, uh, just referring back to a point that was made a earlier on, I think there's a real danger that, that um, you know that those people um and you know that are most vulnerable get swallowed up um by mass unemployment and just the crisis in which we're, we're living in and i think it's really fundamental that we we don't lose sight of that and um, i didn't get to finish off maybe one of the points on the slide is that we're very much tuned in to um my future plus is being used extensively um uh, you know across adult education and fet as well from level three really up but we're very mindful that there is a need for a bespoke program perhaps from more level one to level three on the framework we've scoped that out um, and we plan on starting to work on that project within the next 12 months so we're, we're very cognizant that you know and um, there, there's people with various needs in terms of disability um, and that any kind of tools if you like or online self-assessments consider this specific needs uh, of all, um, you know, of, of, of all kind of different society. So we'll be very open to linking in with, with Nala and, you know, Joan as well, feeding to this on, on that basis and, and any other stakeholders. We, as I say, we're already very much linked in on the ground with services, including employability and other disability services but we, we'd, we'd hope to expand that remit, particularly moving forward in the next 12 months. That's great, Brenda. 
so some interesting things on the horizon there. Um, I think just one interesting question uh, that's also come in and that maybe the panelists uh, would like to maybe uh, very quickly um, respond to uh, that Ray Griffin, who uh, was involved in the session this morning, was interested to hear the panel's views on whether digital by default is a good idea or even possible uh, to provide mainstream public employment services. So if anyone has a particular interest in, in answering that question, and I think that will probably be one of our last questions, uh, because we have a few more um, uh, bits and pieces to do uh, before we uh, get Kieran to make his final remarks. Nula, I'd yeah. like to take that one if I could. Yeah, great, great. Yeah. Um, I, I just, my concern would be that if it ends up as digital by default, the digital service will be seen as the kind of the, the new one, the modern one, the one, you know, that everybody, anybody who's closer to the labour market will use. And at those more distance will kind of, the more traditional service will be sort of, I just think there could be a danger that it would end up as a second class citizen. And in fact, we could end up with a divide. So I think it, it, it can't be by default. I think all of this has to be planned and thought through very carefully so that we are providing services that are meaningful to people. So people who would prefer to engage online, who really don't fancy, you know, maybe meeting somebody face to face, who don't fancy queuing for a service, um, you know, that people can, can exercise that choice. And for those then who wish to sit down with somebody and just talk through their options, and who may after that be quite happy then to do things digitally, but really does need that support, would welcome that support, that we really do ensure that, we're, that the service is there and that people can avail of it. And I think it's also important, because one of the things that has just struck me that's been raised with us quite a bit at some of our discussion forums over the past while, there is an assumption that younger people are more digitally aware and digitally literate and digitally capable. And it's something that affiliates on the ground have raised to those that in fact there's a cohort of young people for whom that is not true. Um, so again, I just think we need to be make sure that we're not maybe streamlining people into services when in fact people might need to be able to move across, use different aspects of the service at different times. Uh, and that people at different times maybe where they are at might need a different service depending on just where they are, they're at in their lives and how they're trying to resolve the, 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 the issues facing them. Thanks. Thanks for that, Breed. Thank you. Would any of the other panellists like to make a comment? Just a quick yeah. one. I think on the yeah. digital default um, uh, piece, I, I, I think, I don't think it's a, you know, one or the other, really. Do you know what I mean? I think really what we're looking at here is digital and technology augmenting the services rather than replacing the services. Like, you know, part of my research was around can you replace people in, in, in recruitment, which is, you know, similar to guidance in terms of the, the, the breadth of the, uh, of the role. So, and I don't think that's possible at the moment with the technology that's there. So it's really about how do we augment the service and give a better a, a better journey to the um, the customer. I, and I think just on Breed's point on um, younger people and you know technology, and it's a really interesting sort of uh, dimension to this that it's sort of counterintuitive. You would imagine younger people are going to want more, I suppose, digital services. But actually, what we are seeing on some of our youth employment sort of initiatives we have within Taurus now is that actually they love getting together socially and you actually can bring them along much better in in groups um, than you can as individuals um, and they feed off each other and that social interaction and it actually it's very similar what's happening in in um, in terms of remote work at the moment across our organization and other organizations it's actually the younger people that want to get back into offices you know what i mean so i think breed's point is is um, really really well made again we, we tend to, as, as I suppose, or as, as a society, tie our different cohorts with the same brush, and we really need to get back to looking at people as, as individuals. That's great, Colin. Thanks so much for that. Okay, so I think uh, we might now move on to uh, Kieran Reid, 
uh, who has uh, agreed very kindly uh, to act as rapporteur for today. Um, so Kieran is from the Loud Legal Partnership, uh, he's CEO, and also um, from the ILGN. So Kieran, uh, we'd like to welcome you if you want to share your video and uh, you can unmute yourself. Hello, can you? Yeah, that's okay. great, Kieran. Okay. Great job. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank all the contributors uh, from, from this morning and also uh, this afternoon. It's been a, a really uh, interesting and vibrant uh, discussion over, over four hours nearly at this stage. Um, I suppose I'm just going back a little bit to the, the title of the, uh, of this, the webinar, which is Digitized Public Employment Services and uh, Guidance uh, Services. And I suppose uh, the origins of this uh, came uh, from two research projects that Manupa are involved with. Uh, and obviously to leave no one behind a uh, paper uh, seminar and paper that was discussed recently uh, and spoke about digitization as a as a potential future opportunity for public employment services need to be thinking about in terms of the design of public employment services and um, what, what i wanted to do here i suppose was maybe reflect a little bit about the digitization on sort of three key stakeholders uh, the unemployed uh, themselves in terms of the job seeker, uh, the case officer, the practitioner, the individuals that will be supporting unemployed people back to training and employment, and then the system itself, and, and obviously then mindful of the employer and the employer need in relation to how, uh, how uh, supports can, post placement supports can be designed and whether there's a role for uh, digital supports in, in, in that context. One thing that struck me very clearly uh, that a lot of the speakers alluded to, uh, one was around the skills to engage uh, and the importance of, uh, in terms of unemployed people, uh, that they're not homogenous, uh, that they have come from different experiences, different educational, socioeconomic backgrounds, and that whatever design process that we have, we need to ensure that they do have the, uh, the ability and the support to engage in any new technology that, that emerges in relation to supporting them on their journey. Interesting also then from Breed in relation to choice, a lot of the public employment service processes, uh, there is no choice. Uh, people have to engage to receive supports. Uh, and then there's the, the, I suppose, the dichotomy in terms of motivation uh, versus real engagement and positive uh, disposal to using tools uh, which uh, clients may or may not be fully uh, familiar with. Um, I think it's important also then to ensure that uh, how do we prepare people for the digital environment? Uh, do, we want to, do we want to be greeted by a chat bot when we're looking for a job? Uh, maybe if we were looking uh, to buy uh, items online possibly and we needed support, but is uh, certainly the chat bot may well be, have a place in the system but uh, how early on do you introduce that level of triage, that level of um, uh, ability to be able to select yes, no, the binary process that possibly may be involved in that, in that context. So the, the next uh, set, of under, set of analysis may be around the case officer uh, and what, what are the digital tools that currently are in play uh, to support them and there was some very good uh, practical uh, tools uh, and, and, and tools that uh, certainly we would have used here also uh, from Bernadette in relation to the careers portal uh, and bringing together a whole range of data uh, around careers and being able to provide some guidance and analysis for that. Um, one of the things uh, that, that, that struck me was about uh, the importance of uh, the emotional intelligence that's required uh, and that digitization uh, potentially has a, has a challenge to that, that personal relationships, personal engagement, human interface can never be replaced by, by a digitized process. And certainly in our experience of delivering employment support services across the, the Irish Local Development Network, the personal engagement with clients is key to success. Um, uh, the sit down one-to-one -one engagement uh, I suppose elicits uh, trust, uh, develops the uh, engagement process and effectively leads to effective choices being made 
and hopefully longer term better outcomes for the individual. Um, and my philosophy then uh, in terms of the experience and, and there was a reference earlier on in terms of Colin around a, a, a process around um, a distance travel tool, uh, the Department of Rural and Community Development along with Pubble uh, developed a distance travel tool for the social inclusion and community activation program, SICAP. And that was done on the on thought of that a lot of the outcomes that were being counted in SICAP were, were effectively binary. Uh, did you get a job or did you not get a job? Or did you get a course or did you not get a qualification from the course? And there was a sense that a, a journey uh, tracking the uh, overall uh, impact of the engagement of the individual development officer with the individual was important. How do you how do you uh, track that? How do you empirically a are you able to ensure that the that the client is actually uh, making a journey? And so that that uh, distance travel tool has now been developed and piloted. And obviously with COVID, there's been some delay in actually fully implementing it. But it's an exciting tool in terms of being able to support it. But it is a digital tool in itself. So it's kind of, again, signposting a combination between digital tools and the personal uh, interface that clients uh, and case officers would have. Um, and, and the second piece of uh, SICAP work was around a whole area of pre-development supports. So not necessarily the uh, job first model, but ensuring that before the job, before a client or, or an individual um, uh, is thinking about making choices around education and training, that there's a pre-employment support process that's, that, 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 that's there. And the URSI completed a, a study on that in relation to SICAP where they found uh, that the, there was a significant uh, beneficial counterfactual in relation to the supports that SICAP um, provided to clients in terms of their pre-employment supports. So moving on then to the system itself, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious uh, again about Breed and some of the other uh, observations uh, from this morning around the whole issue about how do we manage big data when it comes to digitization and this statistical discrimination that could potentially be inbuilt uh, and the difference between maybe the individual cases officers analysis and maybe inherent bias, but also the statistical discrimination that also would be inherent in any tools that are developed. And recognizing also that uh, we have a multicultural, diverse uh, et ethnic uh, groupings within our society. Um, and in that context, uh, how do digital tools adapt and be able to be flexible, to flex effectively, to meet the range of population needs that present uh, not only in, in, in relation to uh, recognizing and um, supporting ethnicity, but also language uh, challenges, uh, literacy, et cetera. So how do we support, how do, do digital tools able to be dynamic enough to be able to uh, deliver those uh, support services on, uh, on a, an equity and an equality framework basis? Um, I suppose uh, the, the, the system, uh, I mean, again, it was uh, uh, Helen from NALA talked about the issues around uh, the, the numbers of people that recognize themselves as digitally challenged. Uh, so how do we, how does the, the system ensure that uh, there isn't this digital divide that's created? Uh, and in that context, then that the, the a one size doesn't fit all. We heard from the Australian model that obviously the, uh, there was a reduction in the number of uh, public employment services contractees over time. And this led to uh, effectively a harmonization and a standardization of the approach. Um, and while that can have a good uh, process in relation to uh, cost analysis and potential value for money, uh, it does mean then that a tailored individualized approach can be lost and there could be a risk in relation, in relation to that. So in, in terms then, trying to sum up then is that digitization in terms of the public employment systems is here, it's coming down, COVID is accelerating that process. People have to be prepared to uh, be supported to uh, uh, do interviews online, uh, to present themselves and their CV and their skills online. Uh, and employers have to then be able to pick that information up and deal with it in, a, in an effective and managed way to ensure that they uh, select the, the, the right person for the right job. 
So my sense is that there are certain um, inevitabilities uh, in relation to this. I think as service providers, uh, I think we have a duty to provide support uh, and listen to the clients that and the, the individuals we engage with, understand the uh, challenges and risks uh, that they believe are associated with this, and that the system itself has to design its digital approach in a way that is sensitive and effective and uh, provides the greatest opportunity for uh, people to participate in a public employment system that is going digitized. So uh, there are just some, uh, some reflections and, and thank you for the opportunity to be able to have a, uh, have a reflection at the end of this meeting. And uh, again, uh, there's a huge amount of information uh, that I certainly will take away and uh, absorb into our own practice in terms of our reflection here. So thank you for that. Thank you very much, Kieran, um, for your insightful remarks, drawing together all of the themes um, that we have, have heard about across the day. Um, I think today has really, uh, I suppose, been an opportunity for us to open up a, a conversation and a debate um, about, um, as Kieran mentioned, the inevitable nature of digitalization um, and to maybe, uh, I suppose, start a conversation um, very much focused in on public employment services and guidance services um, over the coming months because we may of course see more digitalization happening if we're to stay within this COVID era for much longer. Um, so thank you. So just personally I suppose I want to say thank you to everyone this afternoon. Everything ran very smoothly I have to say. I was quite anxious about the technology but it seems to have come off quite well. So. Um, just to say that, um, before I hand over to Mary Murphy, who is going to uh, close the session, I just wanted to maybe share my screen here. Um, just make sure I get it, sir, share the right one. So um, this is just um, the results of our Mentimeter um, poll from earlier. Um, I hope you can see it. So we asked people to type in three words to describe um, how they feel about a more digitalized health and guidance service. And uh, you can see some of the words there, although it's quite small, uh, I can't even see it myself. <laughs> um, however, you can see there's a mixture of words from aggressive, hopeful, interested, unsure, concerned, worried, uh, potential, optimistic, impersonal, cautious, and so on. So what we'll try and do um, is maybe make that more visible uh, for everyone. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to see it uh, better. We'll put it up with the slides um, and of course it'll be a part of this recording but we'll try and put it up with the slides in a, in a little bit better uh, format. Um, so I might just uh, hand over to Mary Murphy now who is going to um, have a few comments on today and to close the session. So Mary, uh, if you're okay. Thanks Lula. Thanks, Lula, and thank you, everybody, who have stayed the distance with us today. Um, my primary role here is really just to say thank you, particularly to Lula Whelan, Michael McGann, and to Anne and Orla in Moosey, who've been giving us very good backup support throughout the day and indeed throughout the last six months in relation to our, our quick initiation into this online world. I'd also like to thank Kieran Reid for his summary at the end, but also for inspiring today, because this wasn't on our work agenda six months ago. Um, it came up in the context of discussions in the larger um, project that we're doing on public employment services and in the more recent context of COVID. So thanks for that, Kieran, and I hope you, you got your money's worth from that idea. Um, we began our engagement and our collaboration about public employment services with a conference in June 2019 called Leave No One Behind. And it's certainly true that the developments in relation to COVID-19 and pandemic unemployment mean that leaving no one behind is all the more necessary to keep on the agenda now. And I would see this conference as part of a rolling um, number of engagements that we've been trying to do to ensure that those who are most distanced from the labor market aren't forgotten in the context of the real economic and social crisis that's been thrown up by COVID. Um, there's been talk about, it, it's very unusual for me anyway as an academic, probably not for all academics, but it's very unusual to begin 
an open conversation, that you're genuinely open about what the answer might be at the other end. Not that we're particularly neutral about what we want the outcomes to be, but we are relatively open and um, that it's not one or the other in relation to digital or non-digital and that it's a, an open, nuanced, complex debate. I really like Joe Wingle's reference earlier on this morning to the similarity between the globalization debate and the digitalization debate. And we know that there's weak and strong theories of globalization and there's also skeptics and realists in relation to globalization. And, and, and I would think we're in that space ourselves where we're trying to be quite, quite open to the opportunities, but very mindful of some of the threats that come with those opportunities. And I think the panel this afternoon certainly were a shot of realism in relation to that. I think it's interesting what Kieran said at the end. Uh, it prompted me to think about our own experience of digital exclusion in the university prompts us that class and socioeconomic disadvantage is one of the real underlying barriers, not only in terms of skills, but also in terms of access to the technology, to the broadband and to the culture around you that enables you to negotiate these types of tools. But we're also mindful that not all young people have the digital skills that we think they have. And we're very aware that our students, although we can offer them quite high quality blended online, predominantly online learning now, what a lot of them want is face-to-face -face contact with us as educators. And, and that's both humbling, but it's also insightful, I think, about the degree to which people want engagement and the degree to which we're aware that having had a relationship with our students prior to COVID meant that we could switch to online relationships and digital relationships with them, having first built up a personal relationship. We're quite worried now with first years coming in, whether or not we will get to meet them at all face to face and aware then that our digital engagement with them will be quite different because of that. So there is something about relationship building in the middle of all this that we have to really keep a handle on. What we're trying to do here through the series of seminars that we've had on public employment service is relationship build as well. We're very keen to build our own ecosystem of collaborative engagement about the development of public employment services and a public employment service that is accessible to everybody, inclusive of all, and that leaves no one behind. Um, we're, really, we're really thankful for the collaboration and engagement today. Um, the diversity of the audience was fantastic. We've had, we've had public sector, public servants who are developing policy in this area. We've had academics, we've had providers, uh, we've had people who are engaged around the ecosystem of public employment services, with over 300 people registering for the event. So there's really serious engagement in it, and we're glad we captured that earlier on and began a conversation. It certainly won't be the end of it. We'd like to acknowledge the funding from the Irish Research Council and Horizon 2020. And once again, just to finish by thanking all the presenters, all the panelists, all the people who did respond and Anne and Orla, and then particularly Nuala and Michael, who did the lion's share of work in putting this together. So we're aware it's Friday, um, and even in the remote working world, we still want to finish up on a Friday afternoon and get that Friday feeling. So we won't keep you longer than we need to, but just to say thank you. All the um, inputs have been videoed, and those videos drop the link in the chat, but we will be sending out more information as it becomes available, and the videos of both the morning and the afternoon are available too, as well as all the other um, engagements that we've had are on the MUSI website. And just to flag two of our uh, final engagements in this round that we're doing, one should be in spring 2021, when we'll be launching a guidance toolkit for those most distance from the labour market. And then we'll have our final conference on reviewing the challenges of developing activation and the public employment services, um, a wide range of uh, inputs into that. And that'll be on June the 25th, 2021. And we have serious ambitions that we may be able to do that in the face-to-face -face environment, but we'll do it whatever comes. But hopefully we'll get to see a lot of you maybe for real in that final conference. So we look forward.